I am in Indiana today, gang. And you saw the cemetery. I'm just south of Lafayette, West Lafayette, home of the Boilermakers, Purdue. Yeah, very small cemetery here, but a really crazy story. And I have to give a shout out to Rhiannon for the story. One of our viewers and Instagram friends it is truly bizarre. Happened in 1876. And by the way, there is a huge pack of crows. I guess you would call that a murder of crows. All up there. I don't know if you can see, but they are making quite a racket. They're kind of quieted down right now, but we'll be ready for anything because there are literally a thousand of them. Really strange. So yeah, the story happened in 1876. Wait till you hear the story of this man that uh, he became famous, infamous. He always wanted to be famous. He talked to his family about being famous. And he did. He, he pulled it off. We're in a place called Shadeland, south of Lafayette here, West Lafayette, this Farmers Institute Cemetery. Very small cemetery. His, his name was James Moon. He was 37 years old. He was a veteran of the Civil War. And he lived here. He was a farmer. He lived here with his wife. He was married. Her name was Mary. They had two children. Everything was fine. Just like Little House on the Prairie, two-story frame house about a mile west of here. He said to his family and friends, as I alluded to, that someday people were going to really talk about him. And as I said, he would fulfill that prophecy in June of 1876. It was a fine day, it was a Saturday, and James went down into town here with a horse and spring wagon, town being north of here, Lafayette. And he went to check into a hotel called the Lar House. Now the Lar House is still here. It's an apartment building. It's a very large building. And he told the proprietor there that he wanted to be as far away from the noisy street as possible. He'd be staying here for three or four days. So they gave him room number 41. Once he got settled into the room, he walked down about a block to a place called Isaac L. Beach's hardware store near 4th and Main, and he paid cash for a razor sharp broadhead axe. That's right, a massive 12 inch blade, the biggest one you could get. And he took that and he went to uh, the foundry. It was Thomas Harding and Sons. And there he selected two heavy pieces of two inch iron plate from foundry stock. And he asked them to make some holes in them, big holes. And line them up with basically the two plates on top of each other, sandwiching the broad axe and then bolt them all together with the plates on each side. That's what they did. The foundry boy asked him, he said, what's this for? And James said, well, I'm inventing a device, an instrument for making fruit baskets. Well, he brought this conglomerate of metal back to the hotel and there in the lobby, 
He had his trunk. It hadn't been brought up to the room yet. It was a very large trunk with all of these tools and implements inside. And he carefully put it inside. And he called two porters over. And he said, hey, can you bring this up to the room? Sure. And he said, be very careful. Be very, very careful with my trunk. Don't tip it to one side or the other because there's some fragile goods in here. So they brought it up, he got it in the room, and then he probably gave them a tip, bid them farewell. But then he locked the room and he went downstairs and he went onto the street and he started walking around the neighborhood. He seemed to be in a good mood you know, a Civil War vet, he was running into other vets and they were talking and talking about the old times and everything was good. Well, about nine o'clock, went back to the room and that's the last anyone saw of him. Now listen to this. <laughs> this, this little invention that he was making let me, I'm going to set the camera down here because I'm going to have to use my, my, my hands a little bit to demonstrate to you what's going to be going on here. So he's, he gets up in the room, right? And he locks the door and he opens the trunk and he's got the broadhead axe, he's got the two plates, they're sandwiched, this heavy thing, razor sharp. And somehow or another, he got or he somehow procured that was in the room a very long, I think it was a one by six, huge. Now he took that at one end on the floor and he screwed a huge door hinge on that. So imagine you have this thing that can go off the floor up. And then to the other end up here, he connected the, the whole axe assembly. So you have this like chopping thing. <laughs> now what he did is he took a string to that, right? Here's the, here's the axe. It's like this. He tied that to like a ring and then it went down to the window. So he had about 45 degrees and he had it hanging there. You know, he had it like hanging there, tied it off to, I believe, the window weight or the window sill. Then what he did is he got one of the Lar House candles, candle sticks, put his candle in it, and he set that right under the rope. But before he did that, on the floor, he put like a butcher block, and he figured like exactly where this thing was gonna hit the floor. He like laid it down and he put that block on the floor. And then he strategically set up a peach box or some type of crate where his head would, his head would go in, okay? Right? <laughs> Are you following this? So this whole contraption he spent hours putting together. And then I guess he had some straps because he apparently put the candle under the rope, started burning, maybe on a five or ten minute burn. He lays down, straps himself in, sticks his head in the crate, figures out right, he's looking up and he can see that thing. He's like, right here, it's right here, this is where I should be. And then he takes wadding of chloroform, puts it over his nose and mouth and kind of puts himself to sleep. Yes, and it worked. Because in the middle of the night, they heard this loud, there was a loud thud and then it was quiet like it is now. The crows, they're all here, but they all, they're all giving us the moment of silence. So, needless to say, the next morning came and what would happen? Who would, who would ever check on the room? Well, you've got the maid, right? So the maid goes to the room and it was, her name was Bridget Clogan, and she tried several times to get him, you know, to open the door. She had to clean and straighten the room, and 
Finally, she couldn't get in, so she went into the room next door, room 40, with a pass key and let herself in to room 41, and then she saw the horrific sight, and she just screamed in horror, no doubt. Now, there were a few doors down the hall. There was a tra traveling salesman from Cincinnati. There was a, a businessman from here in Lafayette named Henry C. Tinney. They heard the screams. They rushed to the maid's assistance, and there, they behold the sight in the room. They're horrified. They saw James Moon's body strapped to the wooden floor, his head cleanly severed by the blood-splattered broad axe bolted to that six-foot-long wooden arm. It was, it was a new kind of guillotine. And that's the story. Well, he became locally famous here. He made all the papers. And they called it the wonderful suicide. The wonderful suicide. Of course, everybody thought he was nuts. He probably was. But sadly, sadly, he would have no way of knowing this. But at the time of him doing this, his wife had just gotten pregnant. Would be a son. It would be a son that would be born literally nine months later. I think it was five days, just shy of five days of nine months later. And this son would look, did look just like him. So, we're here. We are at the moon grave. I had to come down here to see this for myself. Almost stranger than fiction. So there is the stone of James, and it's Mary. Mary stuck around here, it looks like. On the back it says, Father, Mother. But yeah, this is where they're buried. And you have to imagine, looking down right here, there is a coffin down there, and there is a body, a corpse, with a, with a head, a severed head. Now, of course, being well over 100 years ago, call it 150 years, that body, their bodies are part of the earth. That those coffins have long since collapsed, but they're here. They're here. James A. Moon, 1876. His son was born in 1877. There's Mary. She passed in 1913. So many years later. Well, I hope you found this story as interesting as I did. And. I thought it was worth the drive here. I'm going to go into West Lafayette, and I'm going to have myself a boiler maker and a burger. How's that? All right, see you guys later. Rest in peace.